We start today, Justin, you can start the video here. Today is April 8th and I had a request, specifically a great request was uh, emailed in to talk about convalescent serum to treat coronavirus patients. And I took that as a sounding board to talk about all the medicines that may be available to treat coronavirus. Um, so I'm going to be able to speak about medicines I know about and refer you to experts for ones I don't. Um, again, as somebody who studied the immune system and somebody who practices rheumatology, uh, dealing with a lot of these medicines, I, I can speak on the science and the clinical safety and utility of these medicines in regards to the autoimmune diseases I care about. In regards to COVID-19, there's a lot of scientific intuition because we don't have hard facts yet on most of this. I will make note of that. Um, and basically, we just have to have graded recommendations that take into account the risk-benefit ratio of all these therapies. Just as a review, um, hydroxychloroquine is at the top of my list because it has the best safety profile, the most widely available, and it's a utilization drug early on from the disease onset I think it's really critical. You're seeing a lot of reports. There was a study that was published out of France with something like 11 patients that did not do well when they received Plaquenil. I happen to think that you have to start Plaquenil the moment that you get symptoms and not wait till you're in the ICU. Once you're in the ICU, Plaquenil will never work because your viral load is so high, it can't possibly work. Plaquenil works because it slows down the virus replication. And that's, again, in an exponential curve, like we're seeing you know, in the community and the whole coronavirus thing, the exponential curve applies to how this virus divides in our body too. That's why I've given lectures on exponential curves early on in this lecture series. Um, so if you have a medicine that works here instead of here, it's gonna make a much bigger difference. Plaquenil theoretically, if it works, is gonna potentially work better if you start at the, 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 the moment that you're symptomatic. It would be ideal if you had a test that was positive to know that you're following the Italian protocol, which for all its weaknesses as far as uh, how they collect the data and, and other things is what everybody's resting hope on in the world. Uh, hopefully in the next week or so, we'll see some early results from randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials, which is the scientific definition of a study that we can use to practice medicine. Right now, the FDA gave us clearance to use Plaquenil for COVID, which was very generous of them, uh, which goes beyond the scientific comfort level. I personally don't believe um, shortages of Plaquenil for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis patients is as big of a deal as some people are saying it is. I, I have a lot of these patients that are very concerned, but I've been on the phone with them through telehealth, and most of them are getting their medicine. And I have a high confidence that our industry is making plenty of Plaquenil. With that said, I have videos on my YouTube site that will explain Plaquenil in light detail, but more importantly, tell you what I think is an appropriate protocol for community hospital-based use. In our hospital, our ethics committee, our pharmacy staff has approved its use at the dose of 600 milligrams at symptom onset and take 600 milligrams daily if you test negative, you can make a decision about stopping it. If you test positive, I would continue it for the full six to 10 days, um, depending on how you're doing clinically. Um, and hopefully we'll have science to back up that protocol, but the, benefit, or the risk of that is exceedingly low for the toxicities. The biggest urgent toxicity would be long QT syndrome and arrhythmias, but if the patient's sick enough to be in the hospital, they're being monitored on a telemetry and have coding paddles uh, right outside the door that we can fix that arrhythmia, hopefully. And so I think the incidence of that is going to be relatively low and the ability to save somebody from that relatively high. So you can see the risk-benefit ratio in most cases still far outweighs taking this chance. Okay, so this chance, this chance is worth it to me as a clinician. As a scientist, I totally respect the naysayers out there for their scientific stop point but again, I'm at the unique advantage where I, I can go beyond science and I can tell you what my scientific intuition is.
So let's talk about the other medicines that are available that are being utilized in our country already. Uh, one specifically that's in our pharmacy right now is uh, medicine that blocks IL-6. In this infection, again, it's not the virus per se that's killing us. It's our immune system's response to the virus that's killing us. When the virus gets to a high concentration in our respiratory epithelium, our immune system is meeting it on the front line there, and there's a battle. And that battle causes a lot of inflammation. And inflammation brings fluid. And unfortunately, our lungs have very poor uh, reserve to deal with extra fluid. And the, the CAT scan studies for patients that are going through the ERs with any symptoms of cough or anything related to COVID, if you look at the CAT scan, they clearly have pneumonitis and pneumonia, viral types of pneumonia already brewing, even in people who are mildly symptomatic. That's not debatable. That's because the immune system is fighting that war. The problem is people that have very small amounts of pulmonary reserve don't have a lot of leeway. And when they cross that threshold, they're gonna need oxygen and possibly ventilator support because they're basically breathing through water. And then they're high risk for getting a secondary pneumonia and that's where the azithromycin part of the plaque mill comes in, which our hospitals have readily available. So our hospital, by the way, has plaque mill upstairs in our pharmacy, and all that has to happen is the ER doctor or the hospital doctor admitting a patient, if they have a high risk of suspicion, they have the liberty of prescribing it. I'm not saying I'm recommending that they do it, I think they need to follow their judgment, okay? IL-6, again, is for a very sick patient who's in a cytokine storm in which their immune system is in massive overinflammation in their lungs. This is a medicine I use every day for my rheumatoid arthritis patients. It works wonderfully for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, interesting aside, uh, it also works for uh, other disease conditions that I'm not going to talk about here. But a lot of medicines over decades that work for these cytokine storms have been tried in ICU settings over the years to try to prevent septic shock and other things because septic shock and acute respiratory distress syndrome almost always are due to our immune system releasing a ton of cytokines, of which IL-6 is a major problem. Now, ironically, you need IL-6 to start an immune system, so I wouldn't take IL-6 blocker before you get sick because you actually need to develop some sort of immunity and get your antibodies on board. But if you're going to the ICU, we can give you a dose of Actemra or anti-IL-6 that potentially might keep you off of penalty. And we have, I have not seen any evidence that these studies have proven that, but there are people doing it already. There are clinical trials sponsored by the makers of Actemra and the makers of Kevzara that I know of. And there's probably other ones in the European Union and Asian countries that I don't know of. Um, so this is, a, this is what I call a salvage medicine. So this is again like a, having a ventilator. It's another tool to try and keep us underneath that surge threshold. This one I like so much because it's an early intervention and it's widely set. And so why wouldn't we do this? All these other ones are some sort of salvage therapy with the exception of antivirals, which I know nothing about, other than, you know, with the flu, if you get the flu early on and you get test positive, people are gonna get a prescription for Tamiflu. Uh, because it lowers your viral load and you recover faster. You know your doctors when you get the flu, after three days they won't give you that prescription because it's too late for it to work. And that's how antivirals are. I have no idea which antivirals they're studying in COVID, but there's a ton of people doing this. Again, you have to look at the risk-benefit ratio. Are these medicines toxic at all? You have to worry about uh, bed to bed interactions. And Again, I don't know. I know this is what I would consider about the cleanest medicine that's available. I give this to pregnant patients with lupus all the time. Okay. Let's talk about this. This is kind of a cool concept. I love this concept. And this has been used for other diseases. The idea is if you take blood out of people that have been sick and recovered, then they have antibodies against whatever the sickness is, right? And if you pool blood from 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people, and you get all those antibodies, 
that potentially are recognizing different forms of different shapes and sizes of this virus, you have an ideal medicine to combat this virus. So there are ideas going out there which are fantastic scientific ideas where you get people from China, Europe, New York, who are fully recovered, we have evidence that they're making protective antibodies, and you take their blood, you don't need to give them their whole blood, you just need to give them the antibody fraction, or the serum, or whatever is easiest to do. You give that back to them, to somebody that's acutely sick, and all of a sudden, you have, you're knocking down viral loads, okay? For as many antibodies you have, you're knocking out at least one, maybe multiple viruses, okay? One thing you need to understand about antibodies is antibodies come in different names. Um, every antibody that we have originates from one B cell in our body. And then that B cell that recognizes the coronavirus, once it sees its first contact with coronavirus, will get stimulated. That requires a B cell with that antibody already on its surface and a T cell to provide a second signal. And this is how our immune system works. So you actually, in your bodies already, you've had since you were a kid, a T cell and a B cell that were waiting for the day that you met this coronavirus. It's a very weird concept, but that's how our immune system works. It predicted this. And when, when this B cell and this T cell first see COVID-19 in your body, they get really excited. And they come together, and this T cell goes off and mounts um, an army of cells called cytotoxic T cells, which are taking out all your infected, virally infected cells. So they're kind of like going on a hunt, you know, search and destroy house to house, trying to find the enemy and then destroying that house. These guys are their cover. They're, they're the artillery from behind the lines launching the, the mortars. Because these cells expand into mature B cells and plasma cells, which then kick out a ton of antibodies. Okay? And so you have a two-pronged attack from your immune system that's protecting you. Again, I just told you, sometimes this overreacts and it kills you. And so there has to be a really delicate balance here. We need to get a little bit sick, but not too sick. Okay, because we need this to happen to protect us for the rest of our lives against this silly virus. But we don't want it to go overboard and kill us. And so there's a very, very delicate balance. And there's probably a different susceptibility based on your specific immune system it actually makes you high risk or low risk. And I won't go into that now. Um, the important thing is you need to understand where, where these antibodies live and what their purpose is. Um, and this is just a real ge rough generalization. Early antibodies are IgD, they don't clinically have a function, but I just put it up there just for, if in case an immunologist sees this lecture, they won't get really mad at me. Um, the important ones are here, I'm gonna get rid of IgEs. For those of you with allergies, IgEs are the reason you have allergies to tree pollen, grass pollen, your dogs, your cats. These are important if you live in a developing country and are exposed to parasites, because the main parasitic immune response is IgE antibodies. So if, you, if you're if you drinking uh, nasty water with cholera in it, uh, and things like that, then you need these to stay alive. But in a developing country like ours, they're a nuisance because they just cause allergies, okay? They also cause anaphylactic shock and other bad things that you don't want. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, they're not important to protect us against this virus or bacterial infections. You need IgG and IgM maybe to fight off this infection. I, don't, I have no idea if that's true or not. But IgM and IgG in most viral infections are really important. 
if nothing else, they're a marker that your immune system has already gone through this phase and you're hopefully protected for the rest of your life. And this is important to understand the second type of testing that's coming out with a finger stick blood test or, or a blood test that measures whether you've, your immune system has seen the virus. And when you have that test done after you recover and, and it shows that you've had antibodies, theoretically you're a heck of a lot safer to go back to work than somebody that got sick and never developed those antibodies or somebody that thought they had coronavirus and actually didn't and they don't have any antibodies at all. That's the clinical situation that's becoming very real in our world today because we need to send people back to work and so we need to prove that your immune system has been activated and you're protected. Okay. This is a long lead up to answer this question about this medicine. The real important antibody, in my personal opinion, is IgA. IgA has a unique role in our immune system in that it actually gets secreted to the lining of your lungs and the lining of your GI tract. It's, it's a first responder, in essence, of our immune system. And so it has a little tag on the back of the antibody that allows it to go to these places. Interestingly, this antibody also crosses the breast milk, which makes sense because when a mom nurses their baby, you want to line that baby's respiratory and GI tract with these antibodies. And so the, for the first six months of that baby's life, um, they can't make their own antibodies very well. But if their mother's nursing, then nature designed this to cross through the breast milk and line that baby's GI tract and respiratory epithelium, which is exactly what they need. So a little pitch for breastfeeding for six months. Um, again, where does this virus enter our body? Where's the biggest battle going on? It's in our respiratory epithelium and it's in our GI tract. Why? Because the receptor for this virus, the angiotensin receptor, is highly prevalent in those places. If you draw blood on somebody with a horrible coronavirus infection, it's very difficult to detect virus. At the same time, if you draw the sputum or stool samples out of these people, it's easy to detect because that's where the virus lives. That's the cells it's getting into. So you need, theoretically, an immune response to protect these things. So I think IgA may be the most important part out of these preparations. Interestingly, IVIG is commercially available for certain immunodeficiencies, autoimmune disease and other things, and infections. Um, most IVIG preparations purify out IgA to make it safer. And that would have to be fact checked. And I don't know the specifics of how much and the quality and whether um, that's entirely true. But basically, if you're using currently available IVIG, one, chances are that IVG doesn't have coronavirus antibodies in it because it was collected months ago. Um, and two, they may have purified out, purified out the actual antibody that could help us the most. So, what may be the most relevant stuff is convalescent serum. Just take everybody, all the blood from recovered sick patients, and give it back to the sickest patients. Obviously you guys realize that that's difficult to do because of other infectious diseases that travel in blood, including hepatitis, HIV, and whatnot. So you can't simply take blood from somebody you don't know just because they have it, had it, and give it to somebody you don't know because they're sick. And so while this idea makes a lot of sense, the risk-benefit ratio of this coming to fruition is likely very low. Okay, because we don't have time to develop a strategy to make this method safe. Okay, that's my opinion. So I don't think we're going to see a lot of this out there. We'll see this, and this is already happening because it's already commercially available. Um, so again, I said I'm not going to talk about antivirals because I don't know anything about them. I think there's probably some good science behind trying them. And hopefully there's some good science supporting their use. And I will let somebody else who knows more than me talk about that. 
I do know a lot about other immune medicines. And basically the concept is the same concept I told you about for IL-6. If you take an overactive immune response, and when it's going nuts, try to shut it down, um, then that might be life-saving. The key here is timing. I can tell you as a rheumatologist who have a lot of patients on all of, all of these medicines right now, I've been taking them off these medicines. Again, if these medicines are immune suppressive, which they are, and they get rapidly overwhelmed with the virus early on, then that's not theoretically a good idea. I'd rather have my patients have a little psoriasis, a little rheumatoid arthritis, which I can take care of. Fortunately, the sun's out. I'm telling all my psoriasis patients to go put sunscreen on everywhere except where your psoriasis is and go play with your kids in the sun for an hour a day. Okay, take advantage of the fact that we're in spring. Um, I can control a lot of inflammatory arthritis with a little prednisone, which in low doses I think is safe. So I can, you're not going to die from your rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis over the next few months. And I don't want to put you at risk for the severe consequences of a real threat. So for most of my medicines, I've had patients take off. There's a few exceptions uh, that I won't go into details here. So I heard this report this morning. I can't even remember where. Barbie, you heard it somewhere too. Yesterday, yes. Well, I heard it on NPR this morning, actually. That's where I heard it. That some doc was saying how he treated somebody with Humira and it saved their life. To me, that's dangerous. That's reckless. He may be right, but there is zero scientific evidence to support that, that claim. They might come back at me and say, well, hey, doc, how much evidence do you have for this? And I'd say, I have zero evidence right now. But I have a better clinical intuition of how to use that medicine than I do of how to use Humira or these other medicines. I feel completely unsafe with that recommendation. They may be right, but there's no way I'm going to do that right now. And I might change my mind tomorrow, and I might change my mind the next day. But today, April 8, 2020, I don't think it's responsible to use medicines that are very powerful when you're dealing with an immune system that has to be tuned just right to protect you but not let you die. Because once you do these medicines, their half-life is two weeks. You can't turn them off. Plaquenil has a very long half-life, but again, its safety is such that I'm not worried about the fact that that medicine is going to be in your body for a couple months. That is really not a concern of mine. But having a strong immunosuppressant in your body, given at the wrong time, I can't emphasize how scary that is to me as somebody that understands the immune system. I think there's probably roles for these in a slow-moving disaster where we have time to test this. This would be a fascinating field of study. In a train wreck that's evolving right in front of our eyes, it's not okay to experiment like this. And so, I stand with the scientists here on this one. I will debate them on this because of the risk-benefit ratio. But I will stand strong with the scientists and say, hold your horses, guys. We can't do more harm than good. This one, I think, scientifically makes a lot of sense, but I don't think we have the time to do the safety. Okay? And so I don't think we're going to see this. Maybe we will. That would be great. These, I don't see them coming out anytime soon. But that said, we have a registry. The American College of Rheumatology has, has a registry. But all those rheumatologists, when we have patients who get coronavirus, we will register their de-identified data and what medicines they were on, and their outcome. And that's the best thing we got going in our country right now. And I encourage you guys to look up the ACR registry and get the data on it daily. And you'll see you have patients on Plaquenil, patients on Humira, and patients on Methotrexate. And, you know, it's just basically a running tally at the bottom of the screen, like watching the news and watching the stock market ticker. It's not scientific, but it's the best we got. That's all I got today, guys. Any questions? Yes. Do you think there's any truth to if you have one blood type over another, you're more susceptible? That's a, great, 
the question is, do the blood types matter for susceptibility and severity? Um, I've read the early reports as well. I'm not ready to tell you what my opinion is, but tomorrow I can tell you my opinion. How's that? Great question. Please submit questions to Liz anonymously if you're afraid to ask them or not afraid to ask them. Um, I need topics because I can't think of everything you guys want to know. All right, guys. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks for working hard.